Thank you for the invitation. Um, and thank you to so many for uh, tuning in. I find myself uh, almost resembling the uh, the days of COVID when we're all home uh, enjoying our coffee. Um, so let's hopefully create that the good atmosphere of the COVID pandemic when we had the reflection space together. Um, I'm quite humbled by the um, by the task and the turnout. Uh, all the specialists are basically joining here. So I'm also very eager to, to have dialogue and inputs and questions. Um, I have, uh, we'll just start to square, share my screen. I hope that everyone do hear uh, the presentation. I noticed Thomas in the chat that there was one person who, who didn't, but otherwise I'm sure you'll handle the technique. Um, when I um, was asked to do this talk, I, um, I got some, some good inspiration from you, Thomas, to say, why don't we dive into this uh, partnership-based business development, which is a really good title for what we do. Um, but then um, I also want to pay tribute to a colleague of mine who's not here today. Uh, Jakob Lindhen, we have uh, has just joined our team. Uh, he's an advisor on private sector uh, partnerships with us. And he has challenged me from the day he entered the office of uh, asking, why don't we talk more about our failures? Uh, that is truly what we learn from, uh, and that is actually uh, very much the culture we have in, in my team. Um, but I also find that it's not necessarily the theme of our presentations externally. Um, so I promised myself um, I wanted to talk about imperfection, because I think this is uh, really what characterizes this space. Uh, I think we all know that finance is out there. I think we also all know that it's really, really difficult to mobilize for the purposes we work for. Um, and I think it's it's more about the culture of uh, of curiosity and uh, stubbornness um, and uh, really testing out things and also managing basically the paradox that's there uh, that finance is available uh, solutions are needed um, but how to actually make that that perfect match is, is really really difficult um, so. Um, I've tried something new. I've tried to develop this uh, from scratch, um, basically cutting pieces together from our journey the last five years. So it will definitely be an imperfect PowerPoint presentation <laughs> because it might be a bit messy, um, but I hope it will stimulate some, some critical uh, reflection also. Um, so let me take the next slide, just uh, two slides about DCA broadly. Uh, we are last year 100 years old lady um, as a civil society organization. Uh, we were established actually at the, um, at the backlog of the First World War. Um, now we're also uh, engaged in Europe in war-torn Ukraine. You can see the small fish is, is newly inserted into the map, unfortunately. Uh, we are present in um, 20 plus countries. Uh, we actually work a half half um, Someone needs to mute. We work half-half with uh, long-term development assistance uh, in, you could say, uh, poor um, uh, and stable countries, as ministry would call it. And then we actually work half or more than half uh, of our work in humanitarian context with uh, humanitarian response and mine action. Um, we work to save lives in our humanitarian work, uh, build resilience uh, through agricultural, smallholder inclusion and value chains. A fight extreme inequality through um, human rights work, democratization, civic space. Uh, and then we create engagement uh, in Denmark through our secondhand stores, our wee food shops, uh, our volunteers, etc. Um, this is basically, you could say, our new outline of our global strategy um, that the new uh, CEO of Access to Innovation, Kindin, who has been my closest colleague for many years, and I'm extremely excited she'll join Access to Innovation, even though I'll miss her on a, on a day to day basis. Um, this is really setting the strategic direction for DCA. Uh, we focus much more on, you could say, the partnerships with local organizations, with social movements, um, also with, you could say, local businesses and social enterprises, really taking, um, you could say, our, our role as a connector uh, of um, value creation of advocacy of fundraising uh, to hopefully empower uh, the local actors who are really making the, the change in the countries we work in. And that in itself is a paradox to manage when you are leading uh, private sector engagement, uh, often with donors who 
uh, advice us NGOs to bring in Danish companies. Um, but I think we are actually managing that quite a lot and also working with our alliances to, to really boost and invest in, in local um, organizations and infrastructure. If you can see at the final end of of the bullets, uh, we have really set the direction the next four years to work with blended finance as an integrated part of um, how we want to uh, change the world and achieve our goals. Um, and I think this is the trend and transition we're all seeing. I know today there are participants both from the uh, from the company side, from the startups, uh, from the NGO side. Um, maybe also from, from the public institution side. So I think we all see this potential. Um, and definitely uh, we also see, you could say a fundraising and a donor landscape going in that direction. Also their expectations to us to really promote long-term sustainability efforts. Um, so what if essentially happens when grants-based fundraising runs out? What happens after the three to four years that a project has been running and everything uh, in our uh, agribusiness uh, climate resilient work needs to be on self-sustaining basis and market terms. I think that's a key question that we all ask ourselves because as DCA, uh, we are there to support and um, promote dignity of the people who are the most marginalized and the poorest. So the business case is never very obvious. Uh, so that paradox in itself is something that, that uh, we engage in. Uh, and actually um, find more and more traction in. So we want to do development differently, all of us, uh, but we also want to do it the right way. I think for our work, um, human rights due diligence actually stand the highest. I think we are more um, confirmed in our uh, real value, which is the advocate for a, a better and more just transition. So I think our unit in disguise is actually a huge advocacy effort uh, to uh, to really hold future bearers accountable um, to um, still including uh, the world's poorest in solutions, uh, still really promoting truly green transition. Um, but I think this is a map that shows all the opportunities and shows um, everything that we can tap into as a sector, as actors, uh, new initiatives keep coming up. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of incoherence in the uh, structures of, let's say the Danish Innovation Fund has one structure and then we have uh, public-private partnerships like the need instruments, another structure. Uh, then we have uh, the real, you could say, uh, financial institutions providing uh, loans on other terms. And I think the style of thinking is still very much there. So how do we become better at, at creating those synergies uh, and thinking outside the box? Because often we see that we want the same, uh, we're working towards the same goals, um, but we're just not kind of looking across the bridge to see um, who else could, could work with us on, on achieving it. So I want to take um, this look inwards uh, and share with you very openly. Um, DCA has been actually working with, you could say, the impact uh, finance and business space since uh, 2015. Uh, I think we all heard of impact investment, which Access to Innovation has also really invested in uh, as the new black, uh, but also as the talk of the town that uh, really maybe hasn't really uh, helped so many because uh, a lot of talk is there, but the solutions are difficult to find. Um, but we've looked inwards and say, actually, we have a, an extremely entrepreneurial mindset in DCA. Uh, we have developed social enterprise models uh, always. We have our WeFood shops, as an example, in Denmark. Um, internally, we have, you could say, uh, almost uh, business units working on, on business terms. Um, in definitely now country programs, we are business developers. We're extremely strong at identifying the problems, developing the solutions and now also developing the business case for solving those solutions. So I think we are a strong partner to, uh, to solving uh, some of the world's uh, gravest problems, but we can't do it alone. Um, and our strategy has always been uh, not to walk alone uh, and not to pitch, uh, you could say high ceiling concepts. Um, we've always been <laughs> relatively skeptical of, of us going on our own because we know that we have <clears throat> a lot of expertise, but we're also not very good at due diligence and financial screenings. So we really need to team up with someone who, who do that. So, so our strategy is, is um, 
is basically to develop our own programmatic approach in our in our work and then collaborate and team up with existing partners that have um, the uh, financial models and solutions that you could say uh, mass the credit needs that we have in our portfolio. This, of course, has been a journey that uh, we have been uh, leading here in, in DCA uh, through a, a co-creation process, really. Uh, as many of you know, we have been successful and very focused on using, you could say, the advantage of, of knowing how to fundraise uh, with third party funding um, through the instruments that the Danish government has established. Uh, some of you know the Benita uh, Market Development Partnerships now turned into a green business partnership instrument. The, the acronyms are crazy. So I've learned to say both DMDP and DGPP in, in one sentence. Um, don't do it Friday evening. Um, and I think these experiences that we are following, we are conceptualizing it, we are operationalizing it, we're supporting uh, our unit, the country offices that are implementing it, has really shown us the need for uh, catalyzing more investment to the SMEs that we work with, to the micro entrepreneurs, to the smallholders. Um, we have used strategically um, flexibility that the Danish strategic um, partnership with the NIDA. Um, have given us on innovation. So in 18 to, to 20, we really tested and piloted a lot of, of new stuff uh, funded by our own innovation fund that we established. Um, a category we call impact business. So we've developed FinTech apps for um, transport of tomatoes so they don't rot in the fields, digitalizing VSLAs. So, so done a lot of really explorative work. And all of this came, you could say, uh, with the journey of saying, so how do we finance uh, this on, on, on fully commercial terms? Um, I knew um, around 19 that uh, we didn't have the competencies in the organizations also. Uh, so we hired, I think, uh, Denmark's first impact business developer, we call it, um, Carsten Bonasson, that some of you know. Uh, unfortunately, he's not here today, but uh, our great partnership the last three years has really... Uh, taken us far, uh, having someone who has been with the banking sector for 30 years, who know of all the, the details of financing. Um, and he had also worked with the Danita system. So knowing both worlds um, have really um, taken us far. Um, you may have not heard of everything we've done. So, so I'll share some, some of the successes, uh, but also say openly that we haven't, with those three years, come out with a complete solution yet. I think we're mainly identifying where are the needs and how do we link it to, to the existing uh, ecosystem. We've got training of um, our staff in country programs. That's a key focus for us. Uh, now we're developing a crowd lending and revolving fund concepts. Um, I won't share it here in my presentation today, but we're actually successfully fundraising uh, our first crowd lending case. So. It's an actual loan to our uh, cooperative farmers in Cambodia who have worked with uh, the rice value chain for many, many years. They have been uh, found successful to uh, apply for a loan uh, under the Plus Plus uh, crowd lending platform. Uh, and now private backers like the MyC4 uh, platform just in, in New York. Yeah, What's good? Yeah, mute. Nice, Please mute. Do put microphone. Okay, I'm just going to speak and um, and hopefully um, you'll still listen in. And then the next four years, basically, we have a strategy um, to to really formalize uh, our concepts uh, now. So just this is a complete overview of of the journey. I think those of you who are, are with me on the call, uh, working more from the humanitarian sector, you know our business model. Uh, there are new demands coming in, and then there's much more focus on, on how we can, you could say, exit on, on sustainable terms. And now this is where imperfection comes in. Uh, all of these little boxes just show the opportunities that we have been investigating, the catalog we have now uh, for where to guide our work uh, when credit needs arise. So that is basically our solution. This is also a canvas that is so mixed that um, maybe focus is now a specialty, but also we're working in such contextualized um, 
um, situations that we can't just have a, a, a one uh, size fits all solution. So, so for us, this is really the the creative space that we're working in in, in our small laboratory. This is also meant uh, introduction of new vocabulary in the organization. We have run numerous workshops internally uh, with our finance people and definitely also with our external partners. Uh, so how do we really start working with finance uh, as a relevant component of our work? I think there's been a lot of confusion in the, in the sector of, um, you could say, grand ideas being pitched by Danish pension funds, etc. A lot really doesn't apply to our work. Uh, and most of it, um, and the SDG fund, etc., is definitely not geared uh, to, to, to cat catalyze investments in our work. So, so we have really taken it down a notch and and started working with this internally. So to that first question of partner-based business development, I don't know if it's a term, Thomas, but, but let's, let's invent it. Um, I found this a graph, which I think is really relevant. You can see the arrows are pointing in different directions of, of this consortium structure that we work through. It's just, a you could say, a, um, um, a template of, of, of the projects we engage in. Uh, we always have uh, you know, the, the collaboration between an NGO, a company, which could be a, um, a Kenyan company, a Danish company, an international one, social enterprises, farm organizations in their own right. And they each have their own, you could say, business logic. So the arrows will always point in different directions. Um, so how do we go from a donor logic, which is our sector, uh, which is extremely based in templates and square formats, uh, the LFA model and look beyond that. That has really been our journey uh, to look at the bigger pie of the business needs, the business case and, and financing needs for all partners and actors uh, in this value chain. Uh, I think actually the donor logic which we benefit from is also probably the main barrier to really combining our sectors because there's a very tight frame of how to spend funds uh, and how to report and how to be compliant, uh, which is something we invest a lot in and really believe in, uh, because that is also our added value in these partnerships. But it also, I think, makes us um, forced into, you could say, a, a logic that's, that's more square than the world is, is around. Um, so for us, what has worked, um, because this is in itself a big mess, this is imperfection when you apply donor logic to a, to a market logic. Um, we have really um, learned that having someone internally in the organization has been key to making a transition. Uh, one thing is that we meet a partner or we meet with an investor, uh, but who does the work after that meeting, uh, frankly? Uh, someone who really nails down the business case and does it patiently with the people and the communities we work with. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful to, to us having had Karsten uh, for these three years who has, who has done this and, and know his work uh, and or consultancies who can support you. Um, I'll later talk about iGravity, a consultancy firm that we're using now um, based on the recommendation of the Danish Refugee Council and, and others uh, who can also help guide you. But I think having someone on the inside, also from a business perspective, uh, who knows how to basically nail this um, is, is key to, to actually get to, to financing. Uh, and then I'm just throwing it out there, Thomas, uh, playing into to us uh, as a member of Access to Innovation. Um, is there a role for Access to Innovation to really be that, you could say, uh, facilitate and connect in terms of tools development um, for templates, for, for businesses? Um, for me, I, I would say there is. Um, so, what's the uh, mini revelation that, that we have uh, tried to, uh, to, to promote here is that taking a, a broader, you could say, impact finance assessment approach to the work we do, um, going from, you could say, this logic of, of, of the square boxes uh, to the bigger pie. So here, uh, really look at the different partners and the different needs that are in, uh, in your work and look at the bigger financing needs that lie behind um, uh, realizing, achieving uh, the solutions we want to, to promote. Um, because 
as I said, these two logics um, are difficult to compare, but on the other hand, they actually complement each other extremely well. Uh, we see grants as, as a de-risking instrument to finance uh, or be a seed investment, basically to, to the expensive stuff that a company will not be able to cover themselves. It is the uh, organization of farmers. It is the introduction of green climate resilient agriculture. It is the nature-based solution that's costly, but is needed uh, to have a, uh, uh, a more holistic and, and sustainable approach. Um, so if you combine these, uh, you could say uh, different competencies and also our own, you could say risk willing capital in, in the NGO sector, which is our uh, the NIDA agreements. And, and, and you add this to the mix. Uh, I think we can see bigger solutions where we also understand how to put each other uh, into play uh, better. You could say the round, um, uh, the, the round cake could also be a project company. Uh, we've been in very explorative discussions around DCA being shareholder of project companies that could really run with our projects uh, at the end of, of, of a grants phase. Uh, I think we have really concluded that it's not our best role, uh, but we are extremely supportive of of um, supporting this journey of the SMEs we engage with. Um, so this is this is imperfect example one. Um, and you can see the, the, the pie here is something I've added to this slide. This slide could be a, a normal um, presentation of a project that some of you may have heard of. We are working with um, climate um, adaptation and equitech solutions for smallholders to um, have weather forecasts in order to adapt their agricultural practices when the climate changes. Um, we have had uh, the Danish company Ingeman as a consortium partner and a lead business partner. This is funded by the Danita Market Business Development Partnership. But something I think we haven't shared publicly uh, is that actually Ingeman did not get um, a continued uh, business and they didn't get the investments they needed basically to grow their company. Um, so uh, they're actually out of our project. Um, so it means that the pie just became smaller and we had to replace uh, our key business partner uh, with another company that could uh, drive and deliver the same solutions. Uh, so if you see in the blue box, uh, there's an error, which is that Ingeman is out of the loop. <laughs> And there's a comma without a replacement. And we have been working for uh, eight months, I think, to uh, identify that replacement. We've had it uh, for almost all this time, but to get the approval of the ministry in terms of, of getting a Kenyan company in uh, instead of a Danish one has been one journey I can, I can share more later. Um, but again, the pie really um, simplifies or symbolizes uh, the broader business case, which is how uh, does this uh, agricultural farmer in the picture get the access to credit that she needs in order to sustain and increase uh, investments in, in her agriculture and livelihoods? That is really our role and solutions that we have developed uh, over time. And we've applied these instruments, crowdfunding, crowd lending, um, uh, linking them up to microfinance institutions, which is part of our consortium uh, of really um, getting uh, them bankable and, and investing further in, in, in that business um, to grow it um, on sustainable terms. Now, another example here uh, that is not so imperfect because it's actually our, our flagship project that we're extremely proud of. Uh, some of you may have heard that we're working with um, the Danish company Nordic Fruit to produce uh, and um, eventually export uh, sweet potatoes from uh, refugee camps and host communities in northern Uganda. This has been our first uh, partnership with a link to uh, refugee settings, and it's been extremely successful. Uh, the farmers have been trained. They are certified organic. Um, they are getting uh, access to markets and have become bankable um, and are really making their own money. Some are going back to South Sudan with these skill sets and really uh, rebuild, rebuilding their country on, on, on good financial terms. Um, but we have again really looked into, so, so the female entrepreneurs in the picture, um, how can they get better access to credits in order to grow their businesses? They have 
a lot of ideas. They're doing uh, pancakes, they're doing um, cooking, they're doing uh, different bakery and the, the products are now so successful and, and demanded in Uganda that uh, actually there's a strong business case in the local market and, and maybe not enough to export, which for us is actually a, a success if we want to, to create a, a more sustainable food system. So I'm getting to the end here uh, for the commercial um, participants in this call. I think this is probably more your world. Uh, you will see that the ecosystems as we see them uh, are merging. Uh, you could say a growth and investor ecosystem um, that Denmark is actually supporting quite a lot uh, is really um, driving business development. And so is the NGO sector and the humanitarian sector also has money and no one has enough. <laughs> So how can we combine them into uh, to more, uh, you could say, um, holistic um, SDG financing solutions? Uh, I think this for me has been um, quite interesting to see how uh, our different competencies can actually match. But again, everyone who is here knows that the logic behind uh, these different financing models uh, are quite different. So I felt like the need for saying, I think, uh, civil society organizations, NGOs, there are many, many more uh, enterprising NGOs coming uh, to really be that connecting uh, dot between uh, market and, and civil society and public institutions. They have a role to play uh, in the impact investment space. Um, there is um, sort of a role for identifying needs, finding solutions, um, really taking a broad stakeholder perspective on an overall business case. Um, we actually do a lot of business development um, and modeling. Uh, and I think the core of the new initiatives that we have, we're very proud to have uh, just been selected for two uh, DGPP uh, funded projects, one on uh, responsible sourcing of dates in Palestine um, with Selling Group, among others, uh, another on uh, cold chain solutions for smallholders with uh, Danfoss, uh, is really to, to develop, you could say, a, a more holistic and sustainable financing model. Um, and that will be part of the design from the beginning and an active, you could say, activity in the project. So it's designed as part of the project and not just something we'll think about uh, at the end of it. So our journey will continue in 23, um, and we are very um, open to business <laughs> um, and, and dialogue. Um, I think we have a community in Denmark that um, I believe access to innovation is good to, uh, to combine, and, and maybe we could do more of that, because I think we all sit here uh, with the same dilemmas, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of learning to be, to be uh, shared in this space. Um, we have a very focused uh, effort uh, supported by iGravity as a consultancy uh, to basically train and have workshop with our staff of diving into all the relevant value chains that we engage in and really identifying the financing needs and, and, and the solutions and the, and the good financing models for that. Um, that will be extremely exciting. We have workshops next week. I'm going to Kenya, Uganda and uh, and our team is, is really ready. And it, it's a game changer for some to, to, to look at their work in this way. As I said, we have our first crowdfunding case. Um, then we have new partnerships um, being kickstarted. Uh, and then we're forming new coalitions. I didn't talk so much about our, our collaboration with the Danish DFI, uh, IFU. I could talk more about that, uh, but it's one of the institutions that we work with, not as a direct investment case, but really to promote, you could say, solutions with financial intermediaries, with local banks uh, that could then provide uh, credit schemes for the farmers we engage in. And then a bit of a teaser, so we'll be advertising uh, the position of a new uh, senior advisor on blended finance too, so I'll be sharing that on LinkedIn and uh, Maybe our next colleague is, is with us here. I will now stop sharing. Thank you very much, Gita, for sharing these uh, very interesting perspectives on the on the good work that you're doing in the uh, Danish Red Cross. Oh no, uh -huh. sorry, Danish Church Aid. <laughs>
I will now open the floor for questions. We have uh, 15 minutes for these questions. Please uh, raise your digital hand or uh, post them in the chat. Uh, let me just view so that I can see all of you. If I cannot, because we have quite a lot of participants, if I don't see your hand, just uh, speak out. But while you, okay, we have one question from uh, Chin. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, hi, I'm Chin. I'm from Copenhagen Business School. Actually, I'm doing research exactly on private sector engagement with the humanitarian NGO specifically. So like the Church A, MSF, ICRC and stuff. And thank you so much for the really wonderful um, presentation, Gita. I learned a lot from it. So my question here is more like a, like a overall train about this uh, business humanitarian partnership in general, maybe a little bit different angle um, from what you just uh, uh, talked about, the, your insight. So I've done some interviews actually um, with MSF staff from around the different offices and stuff. So what they share with me is that they actually encounter a lot of failed share value partnership as well, like what you just mentioned. And at one point, they also share with me that they don't really know what the line should be drawn. When you have so many partnerships, let's say 80 of them, and by the end of the day, the sustainable and the ethical, the really meaningful partnership that by the end of the day, only have three of them or four of them, then in that sense, wouldn't that be... Like what? What? What will you say by the end of the day when all the penny you spend on building the partnership, or with the green investment or sustainable investment? By the end of the day, all this money invested on them that you can actually have a direct investment on those people who are needed, those recipients and those affected populations. But then you are choosing to change uh, uh, to the, invest this money on the different thing. That in that sense, wouldn't that be a little bit? sidetracked what the main purpose of uh, humanitarian organizations or C4 organizations like the church aid is trying to do or achieve. Because for MSF, they apparently have this dilemma and now they are actually talking about going back all the way backward to the more the traditional transactional partnership, just like contracting, subcontracting. Need to get to the question, back. please. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So yeah, so I just finished the question. So I would like to know what uh, Gita thinks about it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chin. And, and, and actually, we've just started a collaboration with, with CBS, with SEM students who will be supporting us the next six months. Both. So maybe we can connect the, the dots with that institute. Um, I think you're speaking to an extremely valid point. Um, I think it's, I mean, if, if there's one thing I think we're fairly known of is that the DCA uh, invests a lot in our human rights due diligence from the beginning. We actually work with, with not just shared value partnerships, but with value-based partnerships, which is quite different. So I think we we are an advocacy organization. So I think we are trying to screen and select the companies we work with uh, that, first of all, meet, you could say, the needs in our programmatic work, uh, but also matches us on values. Um, so there are these generations of corporate fundraising. There's a lot of philanthropy in, in that. And then I would rather say, if, if you turn it into business development, then you'll be forced to really make that, um, you could say assessment from the beginning uh, that you each bring competencies in. So actually we don't get any, you could say transactions or donations through our partnerships. Uh, companies are investing their own time and money, uh, but we go to third party uh, institutions to, to, to get the funding. And, and there we also have to, to screen on due diligence. So. So I recognize it. I just um, recommend to really have ethics at the top of, of everything you do when you combine the corporate and the humanitarian sector. That that will be a long-term strategy. Otherwise, you'll find yourself engaging with, with something that doesn't suit your purpose. But there's a lot of imperfection in that journey too, <laughs> which you. I can share, yeah. Thank you, Gide. I currently don't see other hands. So while you're thinking, I will ask a question. This one. Uh, as I understand, so over the years, you have increased your focus on working with uh, local companies. Can you reflect a little bit about the, the prospects uh, or pros and cons of working with local companies opposed to Danish companies in your private sector partnerships? As one question. And... The other question, do you have examples of joint ventures between Danish and local companies that you work with? 
Yeah. Um, well, just the term local companies uh, is, is something we have to challenge, right? It's, it's a Kenyan company. or it's a, uh, But but I think it's a, it's a huge journey, as I said at the beginning, the whole uh, localization agenda for us. It's been very natural for us when we work with agriculture and farmers um, uh, to, to work with local market actors. So, so the local market structures are something that we work with um, always. Um, I think, as you said, we've really turned our eye on, on, you could say, the main drivers for change and who are creating the jobs. It, it is the local companies. It's not a Danish company coming in with a, with a tech solution. Uh, but the Danish or international companies, they can really incentivize investments in local companies. And, and that's how we, we regard it. It's, it's tricky. It's tricky to find a good match to, to change questions around an, an ethical mindset for a, um, you could say, a, a Kenyan company in a, in a really, really commercial value chain. Um, how do you apply your principles there? Um, and this is definitely also where we see access to innovation could play an extremely positive role for us as an NGO, uh, extending that network of finding a right match with the, the right local companies we work with. Uh, DI and other organizations uh, to form that network. Um, but it is difficult, but it's manageable. And we actually use our Danish corporate partners who have a mindset on human rights sustainability to help us select, you could say, the ethically right companies. So we do that together. Um, on joint ventures, uh, I think there's been a lot of buzz around it. I actually took a slide out on, you could say, our reflections on, on joining joint ventures. Um, I think it's more about realizing that the burden on investment really lie on the local SMEs uh, or the Kenyan or the Ugandan or the Ethiopian ones. So we are supporting, you could say, their role in pitching to investors, uh, but we also have a very honest dialogue uh, of the risk that follows. So let's say on cold chain, it's the service provider in Kenya that needs to be invested in in order to provide cold hubs. It's not Danfoss, right? So, so how do we you could say de-risk that investment uh, together uh, without mixing our pools of funds. Uh, I think DCA is in that sense quite clever of not using our own funds as direct investments. I think we stick to what we know and the, the pool of funds that we know is what we will maintain, but we would very much like to facilitate and advocate for that. And, and it is those financing instruments that are being formed out there by World Bank, by foundations that we're now trying to, um, you could say, pressure to include more local SMEs in. So it's a, it's a relatively complex value chain. Mm -hmm. I see uh, Teresa has a, a question. Hi, thank you for the presentation. It's very, very interesting. Uh, so I work with the Human Herd Innovation Program at Innovation Norway, and the program is set up to de-risk and support humanitarian private innovation partnerships. So uh, seeing how humanitarian organizations can leverage the capacity and competence of the private sector. So I see a lot of relevance to what you're doing and what I'm doing, and I'd really like to keep in touch after the meeting to exchange, because one of the things we do is develop tools to support the organizations in entering into these partnerships with the private sector and develop develop sustainable business models that can support the scaling of their innovation. So just one question, because we are trying to support the development of more market-based um, approaches, at least around some of the innovations that we support. And we see that in areas where there is a lot of donor financed projects, it undermines the ordinary market mechanisms that might otherwise support uh, the scaling of an innovation. So I'm wondering how you've addressed that in your projects. Yeah, I, th I think we we experience the same, and, and as I said, it's 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 more of a paradox. I think it's it's, it's something we have to um, to have dialogue on how to make those smart matches. But I definitely uh, recognize the picture you you are you are portraying. I think the de-risking aspect of of aid is really uh, overlooked. Uh, and I think the additionality of aid that I put somewhere in my slides, I would like to speak much more into. So how do we get the inclusion of those who are not necessarily in the markets? How do we get the ethics as part of a, of, of a strong business case? I think this is where you could say the, the, the aid money can come in and actually make a more sustainable business case for, for more. Uh, I think there's a logic that's crashing. Um, and... Um, and I think we're in dialogue with World Resource Institute, Rabobank, Bank, World Bank. They're all actually pointing to the fact that we need more focus on business development. I mean, we've focused so much on, 
on private capital being invested in, um, but but who supports, you could say, the real actors that needs to be invested in in order to develop a, a strong business case. So, so if if your organization could help um, support that, because of course we also have limits. How much can we as NGOs support business development of of companies? It's it's not our foremost role. I think your work, maybe access generation, more could help with with the business development aspects. I think we'll have more bankable projects that will be invested in because the interest is there from, from the investment community and family offices, the business angels, et cetera. That's a very nice hand over to you, Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> Please raise your hand if you have uh, questions. Uh, I have one question. I think when, we, when you talk about partnership uh, and partnerships between uh, uh, different types of stakeholders, the precondition is that the different partners uh, come to these partnerships with different capabilities. And I couldn't help notice when on your last slide, you were kind of outlining what are the key contributions uh, of NGOs into these uh, private partnerships. And it pretty much included, I would say, everything that has to do with business development. Hmm. If you had to pinpoint kind of key three capabilities that NGOs contribute to these partnerships, what would they be? Yeah, that's interesting. And this this lineup was made by a consultant, right, from the investment community looking into NGOs, realizing, <clears throat> wow, NGOs can really help fill that gap. Um, um, well, first of all, we should really maintain, you could say, the focus on, on inclusion and ethics and human rights uh, at the core. And I think sometimes we forget that in, in our community. Uh, that will make a stronger business case. And I, it's overlooked by most, most um, a lot of key actors out there. Um, then I actually think we, we, are, we are sustaining efforts. The thing is we're on the ground. <laughs> we're not moving when a civil war breaks out. And that has helped us a lot. I mean, we have a, a, a long-term investment <clears throat> focus. That's why we're actually de-risking for a lot of the companies that, that go with us because we won't leave, <laughs> uh, they will. So um, we're there, we're staying on the ground. Um, and then, uh, well, actually, and this is completely out of it, and now time is up. But I think on corporate communication, which also runs for us, I think has been, I think, a key success to DCA's journey. I think the narrative part of explaining the solutions we need is, is much overlooked. Uh, I think there's so much interest out there, but a strong case can actually convince the CEO to, to, to take a different route with their business. Um, I think we are technicians, so we really need some good public affairs people to, to help us uh, frame the narratives. Okay, thank you.